Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. My name is John, and I am a senior customer success engineer with ShareFile. Um, so I've been with ShareFile slash Citrix for a little over six and a half years now, and uh, been from support to pre-sales to now the a customer success engineer. And our job is to host things like this, be sure that you're getting the most out of ShareFile, be sure that you're adopting correctly. And uh, it's great that we can field questions while we're doing this. The agenda today, uh, we are going over those five uh, quick shortcuts and tips to make the best use out of ShareFile. So we've kind of collected some feedback and kind of put these five tips together. So today we're going to create a request uh, link. Actually, I got that wrong, but more of a request link to uh, have on your email so that if, say, for instance, you're sending emails out and um, you need somebody to upload something to your ShareFile instance for you, uh, I'll go through actually creating that link and you could actually apply it to your email signatures to make things a little easier for your clients to be able to upload things to you. Uh, we're going to hit on a little bit of our e-signature functionality, just how to kind of quickly get started with that. If you don't have e-signature, this is a good testament to kind of show how this actually works with uh, the integration with ShareFile. If you already have ShareFile with e-signature, this might be a good refresher for you to kind of uh, start using it a little bit more. Uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to Tepe, and Tepe is going to go through uh, what we're going to have with uh, distribution groups and also... Uh, how we generate reoccurring reports and some other reports. And I apologize, I did forget to actually introduce Tepe. Again, like he, like uh, Delia said, he is back from paternity leave. Uh, Tepe, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, John. Uh, my name is Tepe Umeno, and I've been with uh, Citrix and ShareFile for roughly about 10 years now. Uh, originally came from, like, like John, I was in the support side and moved over to the customer success side. And uh, looking forward to uh, talking to you all. All right, so let's get started here. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about today is creating a request link. And um, if you're not kind of familiar with how we actually work within ShareFile is, first of all, obviously, we can share files, but we can also request files. So it is a two-way lane. It's not just something that we're sharing out the clients, but we can also request uh, files or items from a client that we're working with. So to make that easier, we always thought that it's a good idea to actually add a request link to your email signature. Again, if you're communicating to your client and instead of them attaching uh, something to their email, and as you probably have seen before, it might get stripped out of that email because of an email filter or your antivirus. Uh, so it's a lot easier to present a link for your client to actually upload something to you through ShareFile. So let's get started on that. Now, I just logged in already to my interface here, but uh, on your dashboard, you're going to see a option for request files. And that's where you kind of want to start off with creating that link. Just like we have, if you're familiar with creating share links, it's really the same concept here. When we actually click on it, the first thing it's going to ask is, where do you want these files to be uploaded to? Now, as you can see, it's always going to default to your file box. Um, and just to showcase real quick what your file box is, that is located under your folders and under the file box option here. And your file box is a temporary space where things are temporary because by default, uh, they will actually delete after 180 days. Um, but this is a temporary space in case you are requesting files. You don't know where to put them in a folder within ShareFile, um, but you just want to temporarily put them here. Um, and if you wanted to move them, you can move them into more of a permanent location, like another shared folder or your personal folder there. So you can move them after the fact. But again, it's a temporary space that we actually have. So again, by default, it will choose a file box. But for instance, if you wanted to, you can create a separate folder under your shared folders, your personal folder, which are you can kind of headline those folders as being um, received files or signature, your email signature received files. Uh, this makes it a little bit more descriptive and understanding what the, those files are from. So you could do that. Or again, you could just choose your file box by default. We're just going to choose file box. And then we have two options down here is get a link and uh, email specific people. So we can create an email to send that request link out. For this demonstration, we're just going to create a link. The first thing is right off the bat, you'll see you'll have a request link that is very unique to this link itself. 
and that you can immediately copy this and be able to share that out for people to upload items to you. And again, those items are going to go to your file box. But for this request, we're just going to make this set up so that anyone can actually access this because we do have other uh, security measures so that you would have to require to sign into a share file account before you upload. But for this, we're just going to add this to a signature within Outlook. So the, the one I would like to choose is the anyone, but it also requires them to put in the name and email address. This is important because when we do an audit, and we're going to get to that when we go through reporting with Tepe, we're going to actually see that when they put that name and email address in, when we do a report, we'll see that they have uploaded something and that information will load into the report. So anonymous is just that. It's not going to collect any information. We're not going to know who actually uploaded it to you. Um, but I would say this would be the best way to go is the name and email required. And now if we're going to make that link uh, never expire, meaning anyone's going to be able to access that forever, you can always choose the access expiration never. Because if we did choose, say, a date down here, like after 30 days, that link's going to expire at that 30-day mark. So then that link will be basically uh, avoided out and no one would be able to upload that. So for this instance, since we're going to put this on our signature, we're going to put as never. And it's always good to set up notifications because when anyone actually uploads anything to that link, you're going to be notified through email to say, so-and-so actually uploaded something through this link and you'll be notified through email and you can simply click on it and it'll take you right to the file. So if I'm going to save that, those options are saved now. And now I can actually copy this and say, for instance, we were in our email here and I'm using Outlook. And of course, depending on just who you have uh, your mail service with and what you're using your client with, all I'm going to do down here is go to my signature option. And within here, now I can actually put a little headline in my title or in my signature here Need to upload something. Click this link. And we can simply have this so that we can highlight that and actually put in the link that we created. So now you have that in your signature. So when you do send that out, anyone can simply click on that link. And the experience would be more so when they actually see that link and they actually open it. It's going to take them to, and as you, can, as you remember, we were asking for the email, first name, and last name. And we do have a company field if you wanted to put that. And I can just fill that in quickly and I can let it remember me. Continue. And now I have the ability to drag and drop a file that I have in here. And what I can do is drag and drop a file that I wanted to upload. And this is a text file for helping delete clients that I have. And then now that file is uploaded. And again, I am notified via email once that file is actually uploaded. So it's, as you can see, very easy, very simple to actually add that as a signature uh, placement and direct your clients to, if they need to upload anything to you, utilize that method. That's going to save again on them attaching an actual file uh, and possibly not getting back over to you. So that's very simple. Now let's get over to how to work with our signature functionality or e-signature. Uh, if you do have e-signature, the easiest indication that you'll see is you'll see the signatures title here. Uh, now you could simply click on that. That's going to open up to our right signature. And that's what we call our e-signature function is right signature. And that will take you directly into it. So you could start, of course, creating a signature and going through that process. But for today, obviously the same one a little time, I wanted to showcase how we can kick off a signature uh, directly from a folder. So say, for instance, I'm in a folder, I need to send somebody to get something signed, and it was to do with, say, a certain customer that I have in here. And say, for instance, I always love to use the example of a new hire confirmation. So if I check this, and more so a lot of the docs that we accept with eSignature, the most that you'll see common-wise in terms of the format would be either a PDF or a Word doc. So for this instance, I'm going to use a Word doc, and I'm going to send for signature. And that's going to generate a preview of the Word doc that I actually brought in. And if I did forget, maybe perhaps I had multiple files, I can always choose the option to add more files if I wanted to. 
but I could prepare this document. And now I could start typing in contacts that I already have reached out to within ShareFile. So you see, I have Mr. John Doe here and I did want to send that to him, but uh, you do not have to have somebody in there already in terms of a contact to be able to send this to them. I could simply fill out their name and put in their email address and that will kick that off to them. So don't worry if they're not already in ShareFile as a client or an employee. Uh, now I can add another signer if I wanted to, and I can set the order of who's going to sign first. Um, I can also add myself as a contact if I need to sign it. And also, again, we do have that uh, contact integration, as you can see, ShareFile is one. So it's going to take all the contacts or the people I've worked with already from ShareFile so that I can start to fill those in automatically. But we do have some integrations here for other contacts. Now I'm going to place my fields here. Uh, one great option that we have here is field detection. And as you see, this is a very simple doc, but we do have several different request options here to request the signer to fill things in. But for this, I'm just going to simply put in my signature, my text field for a printed name, and a date. That's all simple, all very neat and easy. If I did need to annotate anything with my own signature or add text, I can do that. Uh, we can also import an overlay from other docs if you wanted to. We do have merge fields. This is just, again, a simple demonstration of getting something signed right away. Check out our other right signature uh, webinars because we do go a lot deeper than uh, this in terms of what it can actually do. And then when we get over to the review page, we do have other options here, like to add a message to John Doe on what document it is, maybe uh, any notes that we need to add. Uh, we can add an expiration when this gets voided within 30 days. Uh, we do have a passcode where you could choose a passcode so that there's an extra layer of security. We would have to give that passcode to Mr. John Doe before he can access it. We do have knowledge base uh, authorization or authentication that helps authenticate the user of John Doe. Basically, it asks certain questions to validate they are who they are. And then finally, we have the ability to tag uh, this document. So if I was searching for this document later on, it's maybe something easy. I can add in John Doe's name here, and I could quickly find that, uh, that actual uh, signed document. And that's it. I can actually send that document off. We have a great view of the options that I've selected, a history of what's going to happen. Um, and I can actually download this if I wanted to or reshare this out if I needed to as well. So that's another great option. But on the client side, uh, what we'll actually see, and just to shorten out some time here, I already had a document that we already executed. The client will see something similar like this come in where they have to view the document. And they go through the, the process of executing. Now, I've already, uh, the, John Doe has already come in and executed this. This was actually me, myself. But the great thing is, once that is executed, we have a nice history of what occurred along with the IP address and information about when it was signed. So it's a great way to find and look at that history. But the great part of all of this is that once it's actually executed, we can actually see that it returned the executed as a PDF file right back to the folder that we initiated this from. And then when we pop this up, we'll have all of the executed document and all of the information of the certificate of the signing, uh, along with checksums and basically an audit trail of what occurred. So this is great if we needed to backtrack something and understand what occurred. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to show that real briefly. Another cool thing that's coming up is we're going to integrate what I just showed you directly in the share file. So that's actually coming up soon. We don't have that ready, but I'm sure we're going to actually display that in another upcoming webinar. Um, but let me go ahead and turn it over to Tepe, and he's going to actually finish up showing how reporting works and how dis uh, distribution uh, groups work. Tepe? Thanks, John. All right, let me switch over to my screen here. Great. Okay, so uh, now that John's gone over, you know, using the e-signature and the adding the the um, the upload link into your contacts and such, I wanted to go over more of like the distribution groups. So distribution groups, they're basically an easy way to manage um, folder access on your account. So let's say you have, you know, a department or uh, a special project team or something along those lines, and you wanted to build uh, a, basically an access group just for those users, you know. So what you can do, you can go into your distribution groups section here on the, the left-hand side, 
uh, you can hit new group. And for this one, let's just call this the um, share file customer success team. And you have this, this toggle option for yes and no. And basically this allows the distribution group to be shared among all employees on the, the share file account. If this is more for your personal use, then just keep this off to no. But for this case, let's just say I wanted to give it to see, let, make sure that John sees this as well. All right, so from here, what I can do is I can go ahead and add new user from here and start just typing in, for example, John's name. And I can add John just manually like this. Uh, another way to add users is in bulk. So let's say I ha already have all their contacts. It's like 200 people and I don't wanna add them manually one by one. Then I can go to add from Excel. You can download this template sheet here and you can modify it. Oh. And you can modify this. Uh, no, sorry guys. Uh, you can modify this to uh, include any additional contacts that you need. But let's see. So I already have it here. I'm going to open up and import this. And it'll give you an option here to add additional users if you needed it. But um, it also allows you to kind of review it and make any changes if necessary. All right, and then I can hit add. And then there's your, your distribution group. Now let's, we got the distribution group here. So let's go ahead and add this to a folder, right? So I've got this webinar test folder and I wanna add that distribution group to this folder. Then all I need to do is hit add people to folder and start typing that distribution group in here. and they'll find it. I just hit add, make sure you, you select the, the proper permissions that you need. Um, you can also choose to notify those users or apply the settings down to the subfolders. Then you hit add. And now everybody in that distribution group has access to this folder. Now, if we go back to this distribution group, let's say you wanna check um, what access these users have or what, what this distribution group has, then you can go in here and you can hit generate folder access report. And what this report is going to show you is it's going to show you the, um, it's going to show you what, uh, what permission everyone has on what folder. So for example, I added them to the webinar test folder and that subfolder, and it shows the, the proper permissions that those users have. So that's it for the distribution group side, but now I just wanna kind of show you the, the reporting functions. So if we go into the admin settings and under company account info, we have reporting. So reporting, we have uh, a bunch of different types of reports, you know, like some of your basic usage reports or, um, you know, your folder access reports where it shows you the, uh, the access that individuals have on the folder. Access change is gonna be for any changes to access on a folder. Folder storage details going over the, the, uh, the what is stored on the share file account. Storage summary is more about how much actual storage you're consuming. Shares and requests are those links that John showed you, generating those links, what's happening with those links. User reports, who has access to the share file account, and then bandwidth detail, bandwidth summary. Those are about how much upload, download traffic you have on the account. And then finally, at the bottom, you also have messaging which is like the notifications going out from ShareFile. Now, let's say you want to have 
uh, reports that are automatically generated on a regular basis. Then what you can do, you can go ahead and hit create report. And then on some of these reports that have that option, like for example, the usage report, you can make it a recurring report here. So let's say I hit recurring and I can set this to be, show me the, the activity for the previous week in a CSV file. And then I, again, here I have the option of uh, picking and choosing what activity shows up in the report. And obviously, because this is a weekly report, I'm going to choose weekly. And you can choose the day of the, the, the week. And let's go ahead and choose to save this in the uh, reporting folder I created here. So now, this usage report, once a week, it'll run and it'll save it back into this reporting folder that I just created. And another thing with reporting is that sometimes you don't want to see it just for um, the entire account. Maybe you're just a folder admin and you want to see what your users are doing within the, the, uh, the content that's uh, provided to you. So if you're an admin on the folder, you also have the option to view activity log here on the top of each folder. And then from here, you can select, you know, include subfolders and such so that you make sure you have all the data coming in. And again, you can choose what activity is being displayed as well as the, the time frame that's being generated. And then from here, you can export to as an Excel file if necessary. And then lastly, for me, I wanted to go over um, the, the recycle bin, right? So let's say you notice when you're running these reports that some files were deleted. Now, I, the, I've deleted these files permanently, so they won't show up in the recycle bin. But, you know, you're seeing in the recycle bin that there's a ton of content in there and the, your personal recycle bin here on the left-hand side. Now, when you go into this recycle bin here on the left-hand side, this is showing you the recycle bin from your entire user account. So anything that you've been, that's being automatically deleted to do, due to a retention policy or um, that you've manually deleted, all of your user content is gonna be showing in here. But if you wanted to do it by a folder by folder basis, just so that you know, maybe you lost something in a particular folder. Then another option is to do it by uh, navigating directly into a folder. So let me just show you here real quick. Uh, so I've got this uh, Word document here. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete it. So in the top here, I have another option, recycle bin. This recycle bin is showing me the content that was deleted only in this particular folder, right? So if I were to, let's say, go ahead and delete this one, for example, then in the recycle bin for the user account, and then I have both of those contents, but then in the recycle bin for just the folder, you have just the Word document. So this is an easier way if you have a lot of content that's being purged from the share file account and you need a quick way to find it. Um, using the folder recycle bin is a much easier way to find any deleted items. I think that covers it for me, right, John? Yeah, no, that was great. I think we covered uh, just basically those five tips. Hopefully those uh, did help some uh, folks out there that were either administrating or just didn't know about, you know, the e-signature or 
the request link. So hopefully got something out of it, but I'll turn it back over to Delia. So if we have any questions we want to go over, we can show those live. Awesome. I'm just looking through the Q and A right now. It looks like everything's being answered. We just got one in from Jim. If the request files goes to a folder that the email recipient client already has been set up with access privileges, does it make them sign on with their password? Also with this link, are they able to see other files in that account? Yeah, when it comes to the actual request link itself, that is something that, he, that you're actually setting up independently. So you can have several request links if you wanted to, uh, but for this, the actual demonstration that I did, this is just going to the file box. So remember that file box is that temporary space that we have as basically your folder. And as you saw that demonstration that I used that link to upload this text file, um, I can actually come into the file box. And if I wanted to permanently move this over to another folder, I can actually do that, choose that and choose that folder that I wanna move it to. So if they already have folder access, uh, that is a little different because the people that are on the folder that are added are able to, based on their permission, upload data to that. Um, and if they they have access already, they can literally use that URL once you're actually in the folder to be able to access that and to upload that individually itself. Um, if I'm adding a user here, the great thing about it is that it will actually notify the user when they're added. Um, so the great thing is in an email, uh, let me see if I might have a demonstration of what that looks like. Um, I might not have a demonstration of what that looks like, but more so that client will get an email indicating they were added to the folder and they'll have a link to that folder that they can click on to. But most of all, if they of course are a user, they're already in the people section, so they have to have an account. When they log into your instance, they're going to see the shared folder section, just like you're seeing here and they should see the folders that they have access to. And of course they can upload drag and drop uh, files into it as long as remember they have the actual upload permission. If they didn't have that, they wouldn't be able to upload. Uh, so based on that permission is, is really gonna depend on how they're gonna be able to treat that folder or do what they need to do in that folder. Hopefully that answers that. I think so, thank you, John. Um, we have two right signature questions uh, or e-signature. Um, so first is about the bulk send feature. Um, says, does the bulk send feature keep the email separate like a BCC? So a blind carbon copy in an email. Uh, for a bulk send, I might ask one you Utilia on that one. I'm not sure on the CC um, part. They would um, be individual emails. Right. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's not going to be a, a, a BCC situation um, because it, it's actually going to go to that recipient. Um, they'll be in the two fields, um, but it would be individual emails for each of them. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, and I know there's a limit, and I just can't remember what that limit is. Like, there's a number of how many bulk sends. You can send it a, a single time, so I'll have to look it up and um, report back. But we do have another e-signature question. So after a client e-signs, does that document automatically go to their shared folder? I can so, take this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Tevin. <laughs> yeah. So that one, um, basically, you want to make sure that if you're sending a document for signature, that you're executing it from uh, the share file folder that you want it stored. So for example, like John is showing right here, He's got this new hire confirmation document and you all you want to initiate it directly from the folder and then once the file is signed then you'll get the the signed copy uh, copy as a uh a pdf with the the certificate automatically uploaded back yeah and that's kind of what i wanted to show today because i think that's the best use of the e-signature because if you are using folders as say like a client portal for your users to kind of come in to download, upload new files, at least you have that recorded directly back um, and it comes directly back to the folder that you initiated it from. Uh, you can always come right back into um, the signature section here. So if, if you wanted to look at your executed signatures, you can always go back into the signature section there 
uh, and you'll see the one that we executed here. So if you didn't want to rely on just the folder, it, that doesn't matter. You could always just hit that signature uh, button and that will take you directly into uh, the file or what you actually executed already. Actually, this is one I actually executed and it's the same file that came back to the folder. All right. And then I have an answer for the number of uh, bulk send. So it's 300 signers. So that's 300 individual emails that you can send up to um, for a bulk send. At, at a single time. At a single time. Yep, that's right. At a single time. Um, okay. So we have a reporting question. Um, is there a way to run a report to check who, so what clients, uh, have permission to, to what folders or can you only see one folder at a time? And I can repeat that question if you need me to. <laughs> so that basically they want to know the activity of an individual client, right? Yeah. Um, see here, what clients have permissions to what folders? Oh, permissions to a folder. Mm -hmm. uh, Tepe, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing. So if you want to navigate through that. Sure. Uh, let's see. Okay. So then basically what you're going to want to run uh, an access report. So in the access report, um, you can do a user. And even if they're a client, I don't know who has, what kind of client John has in here, but I'm guessing he has some kind of Gmail address. Yeah, right there. Yeah, that should be. So um, I can run this. I can also make this a recurring report just to make sure maybe you you can confirm that the permissions are the same. Um, but yeah, and then you can view this report to see what kind of access your your client has once it finishes. Oh, that's another thing. With the reports, if you see a little blue icon, it just means that the report is pending. And uh, once the, the icon is green, then you can download it for to view. And because I have a trial of, well, I don't have a office license here right now, I'm not going to be able to open this. So, yeah, we could do, um, or you could do the view directly from there, Pepe. Maybe you could. Yeah, oh, yeah, sure, that, that should way. work too. Yep. Yeah, there you go. And so you can see that um, you got the, the, the path where the folder is and then the folder name itself as well as what permission set that that client is. Wonderful, thank you, Tepe. Um, John Tepe, there's a question from Stacy. It's it's very detailed and I, I don't wanna get it wrong reading it out loud. Um, so if you, one of you could go into the Q&A and read Stacy's question, um, and then I'll have the other person answer. We have one more right signature question, so I might answer it if, if y'all can't, which I'm sure you can. But the question is, does right signature still send emails when documents are signed? So the this person says, I haven't received any this year. Yeah, what like after the 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 document is finished, signed, then you know you'll get a notification saying or an email saying, hey, the document's been completed. Mm -hmm. But after that, you're you're not gonna get anything now. And I think I know what Stacy is referring to here. Right. I think what she's referring to here is that she had a, a share file email sent to her and then she forwarded it to someone else on her team. Now, share file knows the recipient of the email and it's a security feature to prevent anybody else from opening that, that, um, that download link. So if you're looking to for example, keep that kind of security and send it to multiple people within your organization, then what you want to do is a different option. So you're going to go in here and when you hit share, um, they probably use the send to specific people option. And again, if you use this option, then it means that only people who have listed in this box here will have access to that, that download. What you're probably wanting to do is more along the lines of employee users sign in required. So what this means that um, as long as they're listed as an employee user on the share file 
account and they have share file login credentials, then they can access the file. So that's more along the lines of what you should probably be doing. Yep. That's what I kind of interpreted it as as well. Wonderful. Thank you guys. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we have a question about uh, license types. So is it possible to have different license types per client, i.e. three admin with premium, 75 with standard advanced licenses? Yes. Um, so if the good best example here is that not all your employees need uh, the e-signature function. So you'll buy uh, e-signature licenses for or the premium licenses that come with your the e-signature portion. And those are going to be assigned just to those e-signature employees. And then for everyone else, they can use the advanced licenses if, if that's uh, that's basically what, what we're looking for. Yeah. Could you and also I... explain the difference between a client license and like an employee license? Yeah. So employee licenses um, will have the, the full functionality that you see here. You'll have like the, the projects, uh, the signatures and such. Um, they might be slightly limited based on what kind of um, permissions your admin gives you. But then when a, a client user logs in, then a client user will only see folders. They'll only see what's in their folders. They'll see, they won't see personal folders. They'll only see the shared folder section and um, any folders that have been shared with them. Yeah, Dealey, I think uh, another good point uh, going back over to uh, just licensing in general and assigning those e-signature licenses. And I think there we could combine actually two questions we had. There was another uh, question from Stephanie about um, that she is unable to share distribution lists. Um, and they were wondering if it's a, a certain level of admin access. Um, let's let's get uh, let's actually hit both those questions. Tepe, if you can um, go down to people, if you could, and um, browse employees. And uh, you could choose me or somebody. Yep. And go down to your user permissions. So first to um, just go into what Tepe was saying a little above uh, Tepe on that e-signature option. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you do have the option there to check mark that. So that's how we assign that e-signature function. So if there was somebody, you had a certain amount of those premium licenses, maybe somebody didn't need it from a different department and you wanted to assign somebody that was going to really use it, um, you would go into that user permission just like we are here. And then you'll see that send document for e-signature. That's going to toggle the e-signature. So a couple of things, because I saw a couple of questions also around them not seeing e-signature, but if you did have premium, if you didn't have, well, I should say you didn't have premium, that could be one reason. But if you did have premium, that could be that you just weren't assigned an e-signature license. And that might be something you might want to go back over to your admin uh, to be sure that that person actually has that uh, permission checked. Um, and then the second one was from Stephanie about the distribution groups, the sharing. Yep. So as you see on Tepe screen here, you'll see that check mark right there, that share distribution groups. That needs to be checked for that user to be able to share those distribution groups out. Um, so that's really important because uh, more so the concept there is if we did or didn't have that checked, at least a person would be able to create their own distribution groups, but they wouldn't be able to share that out so that they wouldn't kind of clog up everyone else's distribution groups when they're looking for them. So <clears throat> I think that's pretty important to actually share out because if you don't have that checked, you wouldn't be able to share that out to other employees. Yep. So let's go over that. Um, if we have a premium account, can we request a, I believe, a personal walkthrough on different features of ShareFile? Um, the good, the best thing that we have is mostly um, we have all these webinars for these certain types of things. We do have several other webinars that go over tons of different topics, especially lately a lot on the premium uh, side, since we have put a lot more work into into making those premium license a lot more valuable. Um, so we can actually list off some of those premium walkthroughs for you on the webinars. Um, and we can also see about getting your actual email address to see who you're assigned to and see if we can actually reach out for additional help. But I would say start out with looking at our YouTube uh, page. Delia is going to send that out. Um, or if you want to go directly to our events and webinar page, 
uh, all the previous ones that we have recorded uh, will be at the bottom. And a lot of them do notate either the premium functions uh, or something like we just recently uh, put out is like our projects and engagement spaces. That is a premium function that we actually just had a hosted webinar on. So 100%, I would start there. And then we could reach out if uh, you need some additional help. I would say with the MFA, uh, so MFA, multi-factor authentication, uh, basically for everyone that's on the call, is a, another way of uh, authenticating. Uh, well, basically you have your username and password, and then the multi-factor authentication would be, for example, a code sent via text or via email um, or what I prefer to do is the Authenticator app. Um, it's generally, in my in my uh, personal opinion, I, I feel that the Authenticator apps are a safer method of two-factor authentication compared to the emails or uh, texts that you're referring to. Just because, again, like you've mentioned, those can be intercepted. Um, the you know authenticator app it's you can those are specific to your phones and as long as you have that phone with you it's a it's a safer method of two factor authentication and yeah just to add to that if you're an administrator if you wanted to have your clients engage in two factor there is this setting that i'm showing on my screen right now under your admin settings login security policy and the two step verification you'll see that i don't have client users actually checked here um, employees would require it that's why i always have them required but the client users you can actually uncheck and check off um, this depends on who you're really dealing with. Some people think that it could be something more tedious to be able to go through the two-factor. But obviously, if you're on a better stance in terms of security, I would check mark this so that the next time they actually do log in, <clears throat> they should be prompted to uh, set up a two-factor authentication. Uh, and just like Tepe said, it gives you about three different options in terms of either text, uh, voice, or an authenticator app uh, of their choosing, such as Google or Microsoft to uh, use that two-factor. And I want to go back to Darla. I forgot to answer her question um, <laughs> that you can basically, let me show you here. When you are, when your clients are signing up for ShareFile, when they get that automated email, they're going to go through a process of adding their phone numbers for, um, for the authenticator. Oh, sorry, for that, that, um, that text. So that that's an option for them. Now, if they ever want to change it, then what you can do is you can go into your personal settings here and then under personal security and two-step verification, you can either add a backup phone or just modify your, your primary phone number. Uh, what Karen was saying is uh, when you added the the request files link to your signature, did you have to save the hyperlink first? So yes, um, I don't believe I actually did save that because I didn't need to. But um, when you go through this process, um, you would, when you create that, it will generate it. There really isn't any need to, there's no save option that will generate it. You'll see that little icon at the top here uh, that you might've just saw that it created that actual link. Um, so this is ready to go for you. So once you do it, I will say <clears throat> before you jump to that, be sure the edit options down here is selected for what you want it for. And again, in this example, I have it for anyone, but I'm requiring them to put in their name and email address first. Um, and then make sure you set that to never. Um, because if I did add this to my signature and I said I put like three months down here, the, the access to, to expire, that link is going to be invalidated after three months. So if somebody's going to click on that on your signature and you forgot to update that, that's what happens. It might be a, a good security measure if you wanted to kind of refresh that link just to be sure that link might not exist out there forever. Um, it might be good just to set your three months, put a reminder in three months to refresh a new request link and go in here and do the same options here. So, uh, but that's that's pretty much it there. Um, just be sure again, uh, you're not just taking this for face value. Make sure that you're going to your edit options for the request link and be sure you're setting up that access based on your needs. Um, because, you know, it could have been that you set up a request link for something else 
and it's going to remember those last settings that you have with it. And if you copied that, you might not have the options that you really wanted to. So it's a good point. So I know that, uh, John, that we covered at the very beginning of today's session, but uh, it looks like some of our attendees might have missed out on the adding to the email signature. So adding that link to the email signature. While you've got that get a link up, could you just paste that really quick into an email signature and show that one more time? Sure. I'm going to just go into my options. And if you're used to Outlook, you're, when you go into your options, and again, this is just Outlook. I mean, obviously, this is basically a link, right? So you should be able to add it to any signature, whatever mail client like Google or whatnot that you're using. Um, so if you come into there, we're going to go into our mail and signatures. And this is my signature here. And what I usually like to say is, do you need to upload something to me? Click this link. And then uh, what I will do is come back into here. Whenever I just generated that unique request link, I copied it. And then when I come back into, oh, I lost track of my Outlook here. Let me bring it back up. There we go. Uh, once I have it copied, I can just highlight the link part. You'll have that little link icon at the top right. And it's going to ask you for the address. And there we go. So now I have this in my signatures. So whenever they actually do click on that, um, the, of course, the user will see this kind of experience where when they click that, it's going to open up the web browser to redirect. And remember, we're just asking for the actual name and information here. Continue. And that's going to present them the actual upload interface where they could just drag and drop from their desktop. Or if it's located somewhere else, um, you know, on their actual computer, like a shared drive. Here's all my portraits here. I would navigate down to any of my shared drives or whatnot and choose uh, the file itself to actually upload. If anybody is using uh, Gmail, we did upload a tutorial video that shows how to add that same um, request link to your email signature in Gmail. Uh, so that's on our YouTube page. Our last question, um, I'm just going to say we do have an option. Uh, I would re reach out to your account rep uh, regarding that just because it, it is a pretty, it's an irreversible function because, you know, again, it's archival. Uh, so just talk to your sales, your account rep about that. Uh, for Maria, um, the two-step verification, you do not need to manually input that into some kind of database. Uh, the, the phone numbers for your clients, that is going to be during their setup process, even for your employee users. If your employee users are just using share file credentials, then when they're going through that, that login process for that first time, it's going to ask them, Hey, what's the phone number we can reach you to send these codes. Um, same thing with the client users. The experience is exactly the same. Oh, okay. I can answer that one too. Yeah, that's a really um, good one. Yeah, so this is just an upload link. So uh, like you're seeing on John's screen, that is the upload link right there. You don't see any of the contents. You only see a upload box. Um, and uh, if if they needed to, then, it, well, if they wanted to see the content, then you'd have to go and manually add them to the folder. The, the, these links are just for upload or download activity. Um, and they're very controlled in how, what you can see and what you can do on the, on the account. So, and then Tepe, I'm sorry, if you could just read out Nancy's question, just because it is a good question and it would provide context. Yeah, uh, Nancy asked, uh, if you add the upload link in your email signature, wouldn't that allow anyone in your with your email signature to see the contents of that folder? And again, no, they would not because the link in your signature is only an upload link and they do not see where the upload is going. They don't see where the, uh, who requested the upload. Well, they know who requested the upload because they sent you an email. But um, if you had that link just out in the wild, they would not know what this upload link was or for or anything. 
And then on the flip side about if you did want to put a shared link in your email signature, um, you could definitely do that as well. Um, so like it'd be very similar in terms of how the permissions would be set up. Um, but like an example of, of that would be non-disclosure agreement. Right. Yeah, Almost like right. an NDA <laughs> or like yeah. a DAA. Um, another thing is if you have like uh, a common marketing material that you would like to to send to your individuals or or like a sign up sheet that you wanted to provide, you can add that all into your signature as well too. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody again for joining today. Uh, again, continue to uh, join these. We we always have different topics that we touch on. Uh, lots of, uh, you know, getting started, lots of advanced, more admin settings. This was kind of a mix of the two, uh, if you will. But um, we also have tons of other ones like what's new. So continue to, to join these. We really appreciate it. Uh, continue to provide the feedback for what you guys want to see on these webinars as well. That's always very handy. Uh, but again, appreciate everyone's uh, attendance today. And uh, I'll hand it to Tepe. Yeah, thank you again, folks. And uh, looking forward to seeing you on future webinars.